Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. The fact that you're listening to a Bible podcast, especially one on a relatively obscure passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that means you're probably a student of God's Word with a deep desire to know better, and that is just fantastic. Thanks for listening in. Now, in most cases, our growing in knowledge of God's Word requires someone to teach us, whether it's through a podcast or a sermon or a book or or some other medium. Most of us need someone to teach us to help us grow in our knowledge of God and His Word. I know I still do. But how do we tell if that person is the kind of teacher who's going to actually help us grow? Well, Paul gives us some pointers here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And so, welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible. Now, I know I've been saying this a lot lately, but as we turn to chapter 4 now, Paul is still continuing the point he started all the way back in chapter 1. Paul is about to address these various issues in the Corinthian church, and he knows that what he's about to tell them, it's not going to be easy for them to swallow. And so he's been giving them this long lead into this main content. He's going to start in chapter five. And so he's been telling this church that in order for them to be able to receive what he's about to tell them, they're going to have to focus on the cross, chapter one, and and focus on having spiritual wisdom, chapter two, and focus on Christ's kingdom and having that as our priority. And that was in chapter three. Now we come to chapter 4, where Paul is calling the Corinthians to focus on the right kind of teaching, which inherently means focusing on the right kind of teacher. And so he says in verse 1, he says, Let a man regard us in this manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now this is one of my favorite verses, because it is a powerful reminder of who I am as a teacher of God's Word, and what my role is in this world. The us here is referring to Paul and Apollos and and any other would-be teacher of the Corinthians here. And Paul is telling them how they should evaluate this parade of teachers that's coming through town. And first, that teacher, they got to know this, that teacher, like Paul, ought to be at least a servant of Christ. Now, the word servant in Greek is the Greek word uperetes, and that literally means an under rower, as in the slave at the bottom of the ship who's doing the rowing. These guys had no value. They were disposable. They just provided bronze and no brains. I mean, think about it. Paul doesn't even classify himself as a higher level slave. Back then, there were house servants and other kinds of servants. Paul's not even at that level. He's the under rower, the lowest form of slave, the guy with one job and one purpose. And when he's used up, get the next guy, bring someone else on in and do the work. And so for a teacher, this needs to be our view of ourselves. Uh, This also needs to be our view of other teachers as well. Not that we should disparage them, but we should certainly not worship them or or gather around them in some kind of weird, fawning way. They're simply the Lord's servants, and they're not the Lord himself. Now, not only that, they're stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, this is Paul speaking specifically of himself because he was uniquely entrusted with the gospel of the Gentiles. But really, the job of any would-be teacher of God's Word is that they be faithful stewards of God's Word that has now been given. Now, that word steward here in verse 1 is the Greek word economis, or oikonomos, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It's the Greek word ekos, or oikos, and word house. We get the word economy from this. And it's the word for the person who takes care of domestic dealings of a home. This is a house manager. And so Paul, and by extension, all of the leaders in this church, all of us, all of them were economies. They were, they were the house managers. They were the servants of Christ, the stewards of Christ, making sure that all was well in their little wing in the house of God. And so if some guy walks on in saying, hey, I'm this great dude, it's like, no, no, you're an underrower, you're an economist, you're, you're just a house servant. And if you're not acting like that, maybe I shouldn't be listening to you. Well, going on to verse 2, verse 2 says, In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Now, that word required there is a Greek word for seeking something, and it's a relatively intense word, Greek word denoting seeking or searching for something. So what should we search for in a teacher? Well, we've got it right here in verse 2, that they would be faithful and trustworthy, that they would just be giving attention to the message of God. Now, this is not how the Corinthians were evaluating their favorite teachers, and it's often not how people evaluate their favorite teachers today. People aren't necessarily looking for faithfulness. It's often said that people would rather be entertained with heresy than bored with the truth. That's not the path that leads to spiritual maturity. So we tend to want teachers who will show us some new use of of God's Word because we're getting kind of tired of what we've already learned. Um, Maybe we want someone who makes the Word of God more exciting, more interesting. 
And so we tend to evaluate teachers on how they make us feel, how they motivate us, uh, what new insights they give to us, or, or what life hacks they give that can just make us better people. And yet what we should really be looking for is their faithfulness to Christ, to convey his message with accuracy and authority. Every faithful teacher is a herald of God's word. They're like the king's heralds back in the medieval days where the king would send a message to his people and the herald would carry that message from village to village. He'd walk into the town square, he'd unfurl the king's scroll and cry out, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. And then he would read the king's words to the people and probably answer questions. And there's no way that a faithful herald would skip anything of the king's message. He wouldn't soften it. He wouldn't try to reshape it to something that he agreed with. He would simply declare what the king said. That's Paul's duty. That's my duty. That's the duty of every servant of Christ. That's our role. And our faithfulness to that message ought to be the criterion by which we are evaluated. Not our smile, uh, not our cool use of words, not our illustrations, not our insights, but our faithfulness. In fact, if you drop down to verse 6, Paul says, Now these things, brethren, I figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, And so Paul, again, is showing us the priority of the written word of God. That is the message we should know, and that is the message we should be teaching. Don't go beyond it. Don't exceed it. Stick to it and just teach what the king has said. Now, in our day, some of the most popular teachers are those who seem most skilled at specifically going beyond what is taught. We need to be careful of that. We don't need teachers who will give us a new take on Jesus. We don't need teachers who will give us a new way of handling life that's, that's kind of like mushing together various verses to some new idea. We just need teachers who will lead us to Christ through the clear teaching of his word. Now, won't that make that teacher less popular? Sometimes, but not always. Either way, if we remember the truths from yesterday, that our work has to be the Lord's work and that the church we're serving is his church, and then we'll have the right mindset and be willing to serve Jesus in whatever setting he has placed us because we are his servants and we are stewards of his word. And so going back to verses 3 and 4, Paul can then say, But to me, it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. By the way, that word court there is really word day. And Paul is just saying he's not worried about anything, any evaluation of the people of his age. And so he goes on to say, in fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I'm not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Paul's not being indifferent to personal improvement, but he is saying that he is not driven by the praises of man, but the rather faithfulness to the Lord, because he knows he will give an account to the Lord for his faithfulness with the stewardship of his ministry. James says in James 3.1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. And because Paul recognizes he will one day be evaluated by the Lord for his faithfulness, he reminds us of this eventual reality in verse 5. And so he says in verse 5, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hid in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Jesus knows what's going on. He knows even our motives. And so he's faithful. Let's just trust him. Let's live in light of the day that he's going to be returning. Let's be faithful in the work he has called us to do. And so going on in this chapter, I'm just going to summarize verses 7 to 10 because Paul is just astounded by their arrogance. And he gives them a variety of questions and perspectives designed to show them just how unbiblical they're thinking. And so in verse 7, uh, people are running around thinking they're better than others, not recognizing who they are as all of Christ, by Christ, and from Christ. In verse 8, they're acting like they've already arrived. In verses 9 and 10, Paul tells them here, they're so great, they're so strong, they're so distinguished. And here he's just a measly apostle, foolish and weak and without honor. And it's just so wonderful that they're doing so well when he's just this upere taste, this under rower still. Now, obviously this is sarcasm, but Paul is just trying to show them, this is what you guys are thinking, and that's way off base. And so again, we see his loving kindness when we get to verse 14, because just like how we ended yesterday's chapter on that high note of God's blessings for them, here we see Paul's love for them. He calls them his beloved children. In verse 15, he says he's speaking to them as a father in the gospel. And so what he's saying to them is not to tear them down, but to build them up in true spirituality, true Christ-likeness, even if momentarily he does need to tear down this worldly thinking that they're all struggling with. And since they're struggling to know the right way to handle these kinds of conflicts, in verse 15, Paul calls them to follow his example, imitate him. 
And just in case they've forgotten how Paul does things, in verse 17, Paul tells them he'll be sending Timothy to them to remind them how he handles others. And then with that, Paul alludes to the fact that he knows some people in this Corinthian church think he's never coming back. I mean, maybe they should stop listening to Paul and start listening to someone else. And so he tells them in verse 19, don't worry, he's coming again. And when he does, he'll examine what's been taught. He'll be looking for power as in the Holy Spirit impact that all this other teaching has been having or maybe the lack thereof because it sure looks like it's not having a real great impact on them right now. And then in verse 21, he gives a bit of a warning that probably everyone would prefer if Paul's next visit would be one of love and gentleness rather than corrective discipline. So get ready to hear what he's about to say coming up in chapter five. Well, that's chapter four, a key chapter in learning how to evaluate what kind of teacher or preacher or pastor or author we ought to receive. The kind of teacher we should be looking for is one that is a faithful steward of the message of God, that they're constantly pointing us back to the word of God, showing us what it says, using it accurately, faithfully, righteously. Not where you're like, I, I read that. I don't know. I don't see how, where they're getting that from. But the other way around where you're reading like, yeah, I see exactly where that's coming from. That's a faithful teacher who doesn't add to it or, or drop things from it, but just gives it to us straight as the straight word of God. Now, as I was working on this podcast, I couldn't help but think about my seminary days back 20 years ago when I was in seminary and I had this Bible class and this class was really a lot like what we're doing here where we had to go through the whole Bible and in our own individual studies, we had to examine the contents of every chapter and then we would come back to class and the teacher would just guide us through what we've been reading. And in really, in many ways, this podcast is the direct fruit of that class. But you know, as I was thinking about him, my professor was so faithful he would just get so excited about teaching the Word of God, and he would just teach us, just teach us the straight Word of God. He taught the class, the same class, basically every year, maybe even every semester, and he didn't get lost in the weeds. He didn't highlight this hobby horse or that hobby horse or run down some kind of controversial rabbit trail. He just taught the Bible faithfully and accurately and consistently. And what an impact he had on me and, and all of us who are listening and all the churches of all the other pastors that he was training on up. I want to be like that. And if you're a teacher of God's word, I hope you do too. So how about we end our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, praying for the Bible teachers in our life. Maybe our pastor or our small group leader, our Sunday school teacher, or the guy we listen to on the radio, or the guy whose podcast you listen to, or the person whose book we read. You may have never met them, but you can pray for them, that they will be faithful servants of God and faithful servants of his word, living in light of the day when Christ will return and examine every person's work. Well, I'll leave you to your time with the Lord. Thanks for listening. Have a great day and God bless.